This is the final talk in a series of seven designed to join up the arts and the sciences. It was first given on the 22nd of November 2009 and is being given today on Friday the 18th of December 2015. The Odyssey as Pure Physics, or Getting Attracted to the Only Superficially Attractive Women of the South. Part One, A Theory of Literature. This is the final talk in a series on biology and literature. As is appropriate for a final talk, it's time to state what has been learnt from our investigations. And this can be done with a summarising theory. Luckily, this can be presented in just a couple of minutes. Two diagrams will come in handy for the presentation of the theory. Diagram one is my view of the whole of the last 5,000 years of human history. The diagram has three sections describing from the bottom up biology, history literature, and airspace. In the first section, biology is bubbling away with all its stresses and strains. In section two, we have the epiphenomena, history and literature. Two thin layers of waves and scurf above the bubbling. History is not historiography, that is covered by literature. History is our knowledge, impressions, memories and ideas about the past. Literature is literature. And above all that is a third section, air, space, astral bodies. These are not just there for decoration, but rather to emphasize the idea of biology as subterranean. We've only really known about it since Darwin. Diagram two. What is the relationship between our concepts history and literature. On the left side, we have writing that is underpinned by lots of facts. These are telephone books, inventories, basic records of foodstuffs, land ownership, etc. On the right side, we have writing that is underpinned by few facts. And there is a kind of continuum between the two. The most important point about this diagram is that at the same time that you are moving from facts to no facts, you are moving towards biological attractors. It's as if they are filling up a vacuum. What are these biological attractors? On the micro level, they are mum, dad, and the kids. In particular, there are a number of constituent dyads. The two lovers who are mum and dad in potentia, father and son, which deals with generational issues, and the last we will mention are the two personality differentiated brothers. On the macro level, we have my two staples for analysis in these talks, northern invaders and aggrandizing southern civilizers. In addition, it might be worth mentioning very briefly, just because of its sheer obviousness, that behind all these attractors may lie, let's call it a super attractor, male, female. Part two attractors. And attractors, let's briefly be reminded of what these actually are. Two years ago at this conference I gave the example of predator-prey ratios in a lake by way of describing a type of gyrating mathematical progression. This time let's approach the problem from a slightly different angle. Think back to your school maths and the idea of the asymptote. This is a rather impressive looking, if somewhat hard to say, word. Its origins are all Greek, 
the A is alpha privative, not, sim is sum, with, and ptot is from ptotos, a past form of pipto, to fall. So it's a not with falling, or a not with having fallen. What does it describe? There is a simple straight line, and there is a line that approaches it, an asymptote. At first curved, but then by imperceptible degrees straightening, never however meeting the straight line. So it approaches, but never arrives. Now, let's imagine that instead of being two lines, that these are two whole systems. Each highly configured states of being with many variables and with high complexity, but doing exactly the same thing as the lines, getting attracted and yet never colliding. And that is the topic for today. Our systems being men and women and northern tribes and southern civilizations. At first blush, that is all fairly easy to understand, but it's blatantly paradoxical. If an object is moving towards another one, given enough time, they should crash into each other. So why don't our theoretical lines and whole systems crash into or merge with one another? The answer that is usually given to this question is that at the heart of every attractor lies a repeller. To be blunt, if things that are heading towards each other are not going to collide, there must be a powerful source of repulsion within the attractee. If we were to take men and women to be our highly complex systems, we might say that men are attracted to women, but they don't want to be women. So they're heading towards women, but they don't want to arrive. If we were to take the tribes of the north and the southern civilization to be our highly complex systems, you have the same thing. The northerners wish to plunder the attractions of the south and even to rule over it, but they don't want to be it. Let's see if all this can help us with the Odyssey. Part three, the Odyssey. Our particular focus in the Odyssey is on Odysseus's encounters with the women of the South. What should we say about these encounters? Well, we could say that they are all summed up in the story of the Sirens, where men finding themselves to be attracted will quite literally be lured to their deaths unless, that is, they cunningly strap themselves to fixed objects during the attraction process. And just leave it at that. But what we want to do is to go beyond handy hints on how to deal with the northern male's problem and look at exactly how the attractors work. To do this, let's take several steps back from the text and look at the total Iliad Odyssey as a unit. And I'll begin with a shocking assertion, namely that the Iliad and the Odyssey are told around the wrong way, which is to say that the historical setting for the two epics is out of time sequence. The second epic, the Odyssey, deals with the only incidental encounters that northern tribes would have had with southern civilizations, and also with other primal groups, such as giants like the Cyclops and the Lestragonians, and with weather and other natural phenomena deities acting specifically within their own portfolios, such as Poseidon and Aeolus. The Iliad, the first epic, on the other hand, tells the story of a much later time, when the North is at such a level of sophistication that it is able to mount a full-scale, socially unified confrontation with the civilized South. So, big question. Why would anyone do that? Why would anyone with a great deal of malice of forethought tell two stories out of historical sequence? The answer is very obvious. 
It is to prioritize the coming to power of the Johnny come only recently tribal invaders. It is to place the peripheral tribal groups who are taking over or who are currently superior or who are currently claiming to be superior above the usually acknowledged to be ascendant power. In short, the Iliad Odyssey is a supersessionist scam. A few clues to the scam. Number one, when Odysseus is at the court of Alcinous in Phaeacia in book eight of the Odyssey, the poet Demodocus is summoned to perform an epic. What will this epic retail? Stories of the great heroes from the dark mists of the Phaeacian past? The deeds of some local demigod? No. It's going to be a story that has nothing to do with Phaeacia. In fact, it's going to be all about Greek heroes and as, at, as a putatively ironic chance would have it, it's going to be about events that took place only a few years previously at Troy, events that deal with a dispute between Odysseus and that exemplum of Greek arete, Achilles. Well, what a surprise. The Phaeacians are so bereft of stories about their own heroic past that they just sing about what has happened to Greeks in the last few years. Completely ridiculous, but revealing. There is a cultural invasion going on and Greek tradition is being asserted as more worthy as a national story than anything the allegedly superior Phaeacians can come up with. Number two. Menelaus' throwaway line at 477, that he is in fact the richest man in the world. What about the Egyptian Pharaoh, the king of Assyria, the king of Babylon, the Hittite king, the people who are actually powerful and wealthy in what we will boldly call the real world, don't seem to have any profile in this Northern fantasy version of the relations between North and South. If, however, the Odysseuses and Menelaus's of the fantasy version world should run into anyone from the actually wealthy South, so the dream goes on, the Southerners just shower them with money and possessions, as happens when Menelaus meets the Egyptian resident of Thebes, Polybus, Mr. Many Cows, 4128. And as happens in Odysseus' story of the man who having left Troy, went off to Egypt to rob the Egyptians, got detained, but was then just showered with honors and gifts anyway. So in short, there is no wormhole taking you out to historical reality. The text is just one long delusional dream of an insinuated Northern superiority. But don't be shocked because this supersession of strategy is a staple of ancient writing. Let's just quickly see how this works. Here's what happened in history. First, you have the Big Bang and single cell organisms. They're not going to concern us just for the moment. So first you have men, then shamans, priests, gods, kings, high priests, prophets, and then last came the single god. When did the single god emerge? Answer, very late. But in the theological writing of antiquity, this is told around the wrong way. In the Bible, for instance, in a most explicit case, God came first and then everything proceeded from him. And in our Iliad Odyssey epic, we are also told that all things come from Zeus and that Zeus's will is behind everything that happens. But how does all this help with the problem of the attractors? Let's take one very spicy example. The relationship between Zeus and Hermes. Who came first, Zeus or Hermes? Hermes, the fertility god, came long before Zeus. He is the fertility, welfare and prosperity god for a tribal Greek man. 
He helps the tribal man who routinely has to transgress the boundaries of his tribe to go hunting and stealing. Zeus worship only arrived in Greece, this has only been firmly established quite recently, in the 1400 to 1300 period, which incidentally is the exact same period that Yahwism is emerging in southern Palestine. And it is from this time on that the back to frontism of theology comes into play. Hermes, who in early art is depicted as a fully grown man with a beard, becomes a young person. And the time resequency reaches its culmination when Zeus is made out to be the father of Hermes. And so we come to a great curiosity of the text of the Iliad Odyssey as we have it today. Hermes, with his epithet, Argeifontes, the slayer of the giant Arges, which is a reference to a story that involves Zeus wanting to be able to get on with his sex life without the meddling of his wife Hera, has been transformed into the radiant one. So interpreting Argeifontes as the white showing one and thereby making what seems to be the offensive anachronism of associating Hermes with an astral body, viz the planet Mercury, which doesn't happen until hundreds of years after the Iliad and Odyssey are written down. But the translators don't care because by turning Hermes into a young man, they are proceeding completely in the spirit of the back to frontism of the text. And because they have a textual warrant, 10, 2, 7, 7 and following. When Odysseus meets Hermes outside Circe's palace, Hermes seemed a youth in the lovely spring of life with the first down upon his lip. And just by the way, in case anyone is wondering, other languages translate Arge i Fontes in the same way. In German, he is Der Schimmernde, the shimmering one. So now, armed with the understanding of an ideologically driven, reordered time sequence and an understanding of Hermes, not in his plot functionary role as Zeus's messenger, but in his original role as tutelary, i.e. guardian deity, we can see more clearly what is happening in Odysseus's encounters with the women of the South, Calypso, Circe and Nausicaa. With Calypso and Circe, Odysseus has sexual relations. Let's tackle this disgusting topic head on and ask what sort of relations these are. For Calypso, is Odysseus a sex slave? Well, this is hard to pronounce upon, but at the opening of book one, we are told by the narrator that Calypso is restraining Odysseus on Ogyja. The verb used is eruko. And at book five, line 14, we have from Athena the explicit, Hermin anank er i iske. She is holding him by force. And we can add to these details the fact that Odysseus spends his days crying. So certainly all is not well for Odysseus on Agaija. So that's all very clear. Odysseus is pinned there having sex against his will. But there is a problem. The island on which this takes place is full of nature's bounties. The description of these bounties is at 5.59 and following. Could Odysseus fail to be impressed? No. In support of this, we'll just mention that the sight of these natural bounties, together with the fragrant smells and Calypso's singing, a singing voice is consistently a point of attraction for the northern male in the Odyssey, are enough to stop Hermes, a divine being no less, dead in his tracks. They are that overwhelming. 573. And there is a second problem. Calypso is much better looking than Penelope, and Odysseus says so out loud at 5, 2.15 to 2.18. So, sex slavery? Really? I think the average Greek male on assessing Odysseus's life of servitude would be saying, yes, that would be tough, but I would be able to cope. And in summary, we are not sold on the idea of Odysseus as sex slave. Next question, are these sexual relations, so to speak, sexy sex? 
Well, the text doesn't have a single word to say about this. The Greeks have their own ideas about what is obscene and sex acts do come under that heading. But if we are dealing with sex of a high grade sexiness, wouldn't we get just a hint? I think we would, but we don't. Given these dead ends with regard to the sexual relationship between Odysseus and Calypso, I'm going to make my own suggestion, which is that they are having ideological sex. The sex is all about Odysseus' status as a hero, as a puissant being, and as a suitable progenitor. A goddess can do a whole lot better than an ordinary human being for a partner, but in this case, chooses just that. And not only are sexual bonuses to be conferred upon this mortal male blow-in, there is also the offer of immortality. 5135136. Here I think we are staring at the nub of the issue. Their relationship, if I may so put it, is less about the skyrocketing of Odysseus's sex organ and much more about the skyrocketing of his status. Odysseus is garnering kudos from scoring with a divine being. And the word scoring seems especially appropriate here. Fortunately, we have a second case of Odysseus having sex with a goddess. And this can function as a clarifying episode. It is Odysseus' encounter with Circe. Here, there is a marked shift in the significance of the actual relationship. Here, unless Circe is a very kinky girl with a sex interest in pigs, she was never intending to have sex with her human male blowings, but only does so, the text is very clear about this, after her magic defenses have been breached. And thereafter, sex is a strategy being used by her to break even with her male assailants by engaging in, in it with their leader. Here, in summary, the idea of political sex on her part is just clear cut. So with Circe, a slight qualification for the concept of ideological sex to that of political sex. And do we know anything else about Circe's politics? Yes, this is from a description of what she uses her drugs for with regard to lions and wolves. Wild animals are tamed by these drugs. At first, we are not sure for what purpose this is done. Amphidemin lucoi ersan oresteroi er de leontes, 10, 2, 1, 2. So these animals are just around Circe's palace. But the significance of these doped up animals is given a decisive interpretation by Eurylochus at 10, 433, She will turn us into swine or wolves or lions to guard her palace, whether we want to or not. In Eia, the land of Circe, we are therefore afforded a clarification of how the northern tribal male understands how he is being co-opted and exploited in the sneaky southern world. It's as a sort of rough commodity. And hence we have an insight into the repeller the actual source of an aversion for him in the southern world of charms and pleasures. Down in the south, he's nothing more than cheap, strong-arm labor. But there is a further element to the clarification. This comes from the episode of Odysseus encountering Nausicaa in Phaeacia. Here there is again a charming and attractive world, but no sex. Despite the fact that the episode of their encounter begins with Odysseus completely naked, and despite the fact that there is a climate of opinion that in the world of less than competent discus throwers, that is Phaeacia, an Odysseus standard person would be a likely and suitable husband for Nausicaa, 
we are on the whole in this episode steered away from the idea of a sexual relationship or sex acts as the main topic. So what is the real problem here? What is the real repeller for the northern male in Phaeacia? I'm going to suggest that it is to be found in a seemingly small detail, the mule cart. Nausicaa is not in our picture of Phaeacia for very long, but long enough to meet Odysseus and to ride back home in her cart. Odysseus trailing behind along with the female servants. One woman driving a mule cart with no attendance may strike us as simply quaint, but I don't think the Greeks saw it that way. This image says that this queen of the south is in control, doesn't require a man, and wields a whip when she needs to. For the northern male, this depiction is of a very dangerous state of affairs. Moreover, what is a mule? In English, the term doesn't explain itself, but in Greek it does. Hermionos, half a donkey. What's the other half? A horse. Mules have been bred from donkeys using a stallion. In summary, in the emblem of Nausicaa riding unaccompanied in her mule cart and with her very telling vigorous use of the whip, himasso, Odysseus, together with the Greek audience, is being offered a summary exposition of a repeller of the danger for the northerner in the happy land of Phaeacia. Down in the south, males have only limited use and are a far from irreplaceable or essential commodity. Women in the South are powerful and in control and are a very serious obstacle to old fashioned paternalistic blokes who are used to running their own affairs. But the true center of the repeller is to be discerned in the being and fate of the mule. A half breed animal only fit for slavish physical activity and a portent of genetic oblivion. Conclusion. In this talk, we look briefly at a theory of literature to paint a background for the idea of heading towards attractors. We presented a way of thinking about the attractor by using the illustration of the asymptote. To understand how this applies to the Odyssey, we had to first clear up issues that relate to the genre of the Iliad Odyssey dyad. The two epics are deliberately out of historical sequence and for the purpose of making a polemical claim about the North vis-a-vis -vis the South, namely that the former is superior to the latter, despite coming after it in time. Our thumbnail examples of this supersessionist scam were Demodocus's epic of recent news from Troy and Menelaus's claim to be the richest man in the world. Our chosen extended elucidation of the scam and how attractors relate to it involved a quick info bite about the origins of monotheism and the cases of Zeus and Hermes. Hermes came before Zeus, but ends up as his son. His new ideologically devised role as Zeus's errand boy can't however expunge his earlier incarnation as a sort of factotum tutelary deity for Northern tribal man, who oversees especially his sex drive. The primal role for Hermes helps us to understand the context for our main topic, Odysseus with Calypso, Circe and Nausicaa. We find that the sexual relationships with the goddesses Calypso and Circe are really just a big noting of the status of the Northern male. But we also find that these southern women represent a real political danger to the innocent roaming stallion that the northern male imagines himself to be. The Nausicaa episode, however, takes a very significant further step with its own particular treatment of the northern male's discomfort in the south. Whilst persisting with a sexual theme, the Phaeacian visit goes beyond the question of physical sex and beyond even the political dangers that go with it to what can only be called a full-blown existential or evolutionary problem. 
males are of limited value in the South, and while there, are heading for a genetic trivialization. Thanks. <laughs>